Welcome to this All Saints Sunday here at Fishers of Men. My name is Pastor Chad Bresson. I'm pastor at the table of Los Fresnos. We worship every Sunday at 1030, so I apologize. Uh, as soon as uh, this service is over, I'm going to have to make a rush to get over there. In fact, today we're meeting outdoors. Uh, one of the things about the table is we rent the community center there in Los Fresnos, which is right next to the police station. If you know anything about Los Fresnos, that building is a precinct <laughs> three Sundays or three weeks out of the year, and so they move us out. The precinct takes over, and we end up at Memorial Park, so we're having an outdoor service today because of the elections. But it's all good. Uh, I bring you greetings from the table, and I'm happy to be here serving you uh, this, this week. In fact, uh, I'm going to be serving you for the next few weeks here at Fishers of Men, and hopefully throughout that time we'll get to know each other a little better. Uh, one thing I want to draw your attention to today, you're going to hear us talking about the Bible binge, the table and St. Paul, as well as we'd like Fishers of Men to join in. We're doing the Bible binge. It started last week. It's a 14-month journey through the Bible. Uh, it's a Bible reading plan. There's also a series of devotions available at St. Paul's uh, Facebook page. Um, and the sermons uh, throughout the 14 months will be hitting on the various books of the Bible. It's a way for us to get to know our Bibles a little better. So I've got some bookmarks. I put them on the table back there. I encourage you to pick one up and join us. We're in the book of Mark right now. We're going to be in the book of Genesis in a week or so. So I encourage you to pick this up, and it's very easy to, to just jump in wherever. Uh, no guilt. You don't have to feel like you have to do the whole thing. Just pick up wherever and take off with us. We do have one announcement, though, about Saturday.
And men, you're welcome to attend and keep me company because I have to be there. <laughs> no, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I do want to be there. It's a joy to serve LWML as well. Let's stand for our first hymn this morning. Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O oh Lord, kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are here. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake, forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority. I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. In you, O Lord, do I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me. For you are my rock and my fortress. And for your name's sake, you lead me and guide me. Into your hand I commit my spirit. You have indeed me, O Lord, faithful God. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning is now and will be forever. Amen. 
These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. Lord, be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious Lord, you cause your word to be proclaimed in every generation. Stir up our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may receive this proclamation with humility and finally be exalted at the coming of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. The first reading for today is from the seventh chapter of Revelations, beginning with the ninth verse. After this I looked, and behold, a great multitude that no one could number from every nation, from all tribes and people and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders, elders and the four living creatures. And they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? clothed in white robes, and from where have they come? I said to him, Sir, you know, and he said to me, These are the ones coming out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore they are before the throne of God, and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The epistle lesson today is from the third chapter of 1 John, 
beginning with the first verse. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that he did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what will we be has not yet appeared. But we know that when we appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, Lord. Seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, the disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. This morning, let us confess our faith in Jesus Christ using the words from the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look forward for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
World Series this week. Anybody celebrating a team from Texas winning the World Series this year? <laughs> right. A lot of people here think it's the wrong team from Texas. <laughs> they won on the road. They won in Arizona. They were at Chase Field in Arizona. And Chase Field is, it, is home to an iconic pool. So you see the Rangers here celebrating. Well, after the celebration, first thing you do when you win something is you celebrate. And that's what the Diamondbacks did when they won their ch championship league series. They jumped in the pool. Well, now the Rangers won the World Series. They did not get to jump in the pool. <laughs> see security? <laughs> security was waiting. It's kind of ironic. A pool that was designed for celebration, a team that's celebrating is not allowed to use it for celebration. <laughs> In fact, the Diamondbacks were saying this week, well, only the Diamondbacks should be using that pool to celebrate, and they were on the losing end. We're talking about irony this week. We're in the book of Mark. You can't come to the book of Mark without talking about irony. Now, last week at the table, we began a series called The Bible Bench, and we began in the book of Mark. Mark is kind of the first book. In fact, it is the oldest book we have. It's the earliest biography that we have of Jesus that was written. Mark's a great place to start if you're going to spend 14 months moving your way through the Bible. And one of the reasons for doing this is just to get us in the habit of reading, which is what we're going to be doing for the next 14 months, becoming familiar again with what's in our Bibles. So we begin in the book of Mark. Mark begins, and Mark is a book of action. It's another reason why it's kind of nice to start in the book of Mark. Mark is just filled with a lot of the stuff that Jesus is doing, things that are happening to him. There is teaching from Jesus in the book of Mark, but unlike some of the other biographies that we have in our New Testaments of Jesus, those those bits and sections of teaching are, are not quite as long. They're kind of short, again, to keep the action moving and flowing. So Mark is a book of action. The other interesting thing about Mark is Mark tells you right away why he is writing the bi this biography of this person they know as Jesus. In fact, he's writing probably about 30, 25 to 30 years after Jesus ascends into heaven and he's writing to a, a congregation probably a lot like this one. Probably somewhere in and around Rome. So he's writing. Here's this Jesus that, that, that we say we believe and confess. He writes a book of action, but he starts off and he gives us his thesis statement. And here it is. First verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel. Gospel good news. This is good news about this Messiah, Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah, the one who was promised in the Old Testament. This is all good news. And a little later he's going to say that this gospel is the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has come near in this person of Jesus. Jesus is the king of Israel. And that kingdom is now here in his person, the king. But there's also this in Mark. Mark is a biography that is filled with ambiguity, fear, and irony. It's good news, but this good news comes in a context in which people just can't figure Jesus out. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of ambiguity about who Jesus is. In fact, his own followers don't really get him. They struggle. Everybody seems to struggle with Jesus throughout the book of Mark. And Mark is also full of the ironic. The ironic just flows from the first chapter on. I mean, this is the book where we're told those who would save their lives are going to lose it. Those who would lose their lives will save it. That's irony. And Jesus himself says, I came not for those who are healthy, but for those who are sick. That's irony. Mark wants us to see that the Messiah who had been predicted, the one who was promised, the one who was coming, the one who is now here, that's very unsettling 
It's very unnerving. He's come to disrupt the status quo. In fact, he comes as the Old Testament Messiah, but he is not the Messiah that we expected or wanted, as it becomes quite apparent. So fear rules. In fact, I encourage you, if you begin this series with us and you start to walk through the book of Mark with us and you start reading this week, circle the number of times that you see the word fear or afraid or terror or terrified. Mark is full of this. Because this one who comes has come to append what we think to be true. He's come to challenge our worldview. He's come to challenge the status quo. Fear rules. Now fear is not the only main theme. Here's the other main theme in the book of Mark. It also shows up in the very first verse. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Son of God is also a big deal throughout Mark, from the very opening pages to the very end. Son of God is who Jesus is presented to be. So this expected one that comes from heaven, this, this Messiah, the one that had been promised in the Old Testament, is divine. He's not of this world. It's God himself. God himself. The Messiah is called the Son of God. In fact, in the Old Testament, throughout the Old Testament, even Israel's kings, starting with David especially, were known as God's sons. They ruled Israel as sons of God. They, they were, those kings were a way to, or to understand, how God rules his people. So the one about whom this biography is being written is the promised one of the Old Testament. Oh, but he's also something more. He's divine. And Mark puts that front and center. But the interesting thing is, remember what we said about fear, ambiguity, ironic? The Son of God is also being presented that way. Now, if you begin your biography with this kind of statement, we would expect the author to back up the claims, and he does. Mark is now going to unfold for us just how Jesus is that promised one of the Old Testament, the Messiah and the Son of God. But he does it in a very unexpected way. Now, we're about to come to my favorite time of year. In fact, I've already started the Christmas music at my house. I know. People are going to roll your eyes. All right. November the 1st is, is when I start playing it. I love, I love Christmas, and I love Christmas because of the Incarnation. And Christmas is a time for, think to, for us to stop and think about what it means for God to become one of us. You know, the Incarnation is wonderful. It's, it's comforting. It's something we need, and we know we need God to come and be among us. But Mark here is reminding us that God being among us is also kind of disturbing. God walking among us at times can be unsettling, subversive. And for many of Mark, the coming of the Messiah, who is in fact God himself, is kind of scary. Kind of scary. It's the nightmare of Christmas for them. A popular song some years ago asked the question, what if God were one of us? Mark answers that question, and he answers it in a way that kind of makes us feel uneasy. And when we get to the end, we're like, what are you doing, Mark? You see, in Mark, it's the religious people, it's Jesus' best friends, it's Jesus' followers, it's all the people who have their act together, the morally upright, the Christian heroes, they're the ones who are unsettled. They cannot bring themselves, and as the story unfolds in Mark, they can't bring themselves to talk about this Messiah, this rabbi who comes teaching. They can't bring themselves to actually say he's the Son of God. So what happens is Mark is going to tell us this story, and he is going to show us that Jesus is the Son of God, but that proclamation is going to be in some places rather unexpected. The first place is at Jesus' baptism. 
And this is a story we're familiar with. Jesus is baptized, and then there's this big voice from heaven that says, voice came from heaven, you are my, my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. My beloved son. Now we read that and we think, yes, here we have an affirmation of this Messiah who comes with the kingdom being near and he's being affirmed by the Heavenly Father as a beloved son. We forget, though, that the way Mark writes it, a voice came from heaven. You and I both know that's the Father, but the way he's writing it is this voice. And if you're reading this, you, you, you start to think, oh, this is that voice at Sinai. This is the voice that shows up every now and then and just shakes the earth. This is the voice that causes terror. In fact, some of the way the other gospel writers write it, it is kind of like that here. Again, we have all these fuzzy pictures of Jesus' baptism. And what we don't have is this booming voice that absolutely rattles the earth. This is my beloved son. A great thunderous declaration. Make no mistake that the one being baptized is the Son of God. He is divine. He is the one who has come to seek and save the lost. But that declaration is not exactly the stuff of warm fuzzies. Mark continues his story. We're left with that. And we're wondering, okay, you've said that he's the Son of God. Who's going to say it? We get to Mark 5. And if we thought that Mark was going to play along with our expectations, he shatters them. And I'm going to read a little section from Mark so you get the sense of where this is going. In Mark 5, Mark tells this story. Man with an unclean spirit came out of the tombs and met Jesus. He lived in the tombs. No one was able to restrain him anymore, not even with a chain, because he often had been bound with shackles and chains. But he torn the chains apart and he smashed the shackles. No one was strong enough to subdue him day and night among the tombs and on the mountains. He was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Nice guy, right? When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and knelt down before him and he cried out with a loud voice, What do you have to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High? Oh, okay. This weird guy out there who is absolutely violent that nobody can control, and we find out, if we were to continue reading, that these are demons talking. Demons. Demons are saying that Jesus is the Son of God. Demons already, in Mark's biography, have, Jesus, have declared Jesus to be the Messiah in another incident where they say, oh, hey, you're the one that was promised. Now they're saying, oh, you're the Son of God. So you have this loud, booming voice saying that Jesus is the Son of God. And now you've got demons. The people who are absolutely opposed to Jesus even being on earth in the first place. Declaring that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, Jesus heals this man, by the way. But Mark continues his biography. We get toward the end. And along the way, you start to wonder, especially if you've read the book of Matthew, which is another biography, you begin to wonder, what about Peter? Peter's the one with the great confession. Peter's the one who made this grand confession, the confession on which the church is built, that you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's Matthew. You know how Mark writes that whole incident here? Mark 8. Peter says, yep, you're the Messiah, full stop. Mark wants us to feel that angst. He doesn't have Peter saying that here. He wants to force us into this position of just wondering, just who is going to step up and finally say once and for all for the church that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and in Mark it isn't Peter. Peter doesn't rise to the task. He wants us to feel this weight of the 
church, a religion. He wants us to see that all the people in Mark are so focused on themselves, they're all focused on their good behavior, that they miss the gospel and they miss who Jesus is. The people that were supposed to get it. And finally, he gets to the cross, and there is somebody. There is a shockingly ironic confession at the cross. At the cross, as Mark describes it, Jesus dies with the sinners. He's crucified between two thieves. And you got all these voices. It's noisy at the cross. Saying, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, if you're who you say you are, come down from the cross, save yourself. And finally, somebody standing at the cross makes the declaration that we've been waiting for throughout the entire biography of Mark. When the centurion who was standing opposite him saw the way that Jesus brings him back, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Well, there you have it. Finally, somebody with flesh and blood not the father, not the demon, somebody that's human. Finally saying, truly, this is the Son of God. Well, there you go. That's a confession to, to stake your life on. That's the confession to build a church on. Truly, this is the Son of God. Jesus is who Mark says he is. He is the promised one waited for throughout all the ages, the king of Israel who finally comes and brings the kingdom. This is the son of God. But the interesting thing, we've gotten to the cross, we've gotten to the end. And this confession is not on the lips of his followers. It's not on the lips of the religious. It's not on the list of the Christians. It's not on the lips of the, the pastors, the ones with the podcasts, the ones with the seminars and conferences. It's not on the lips of the theologians. Mark wants us to stop and see. He says, standing opposite him. In other words, take a look at that. A centurion. Stinking, filthy centurion. Murderous Roman soldier. A Gentile. The very thing that we don't want our sons to grow up to be. That guy. And of all the ironies of Mark, that's the, that's the shocking irony of it. You finally have this great, grand confession, and it's on the lips of a sinner. And it's not an accident. If we keep reading uh, throughout that, that cross story, that the centurion is mentioned, and the very next person that's mentioned is Mary Magdalene at the cross. Another sinner. Sinner. What's interesting is Jesus called this. He said this. This is the way it's going to be. Earlier in the biography, Jesus says this. I didn't come to call the righteous. I came to call the sinners. And oh, by the way, guess who's confessing Jesus at the end? It's the sinners. Sinners. I mean, and this is the worst of the sinner, Roman soldier. The worst of the sinners is watching the king of Israel die. And he's confessing what is now clear to him. That the father was right. Those demons were right. This is the son of God. We just killed the son of God. The son of God was here. And we missed it. And I get it. We come and we stand that. We stand looking at him opposite Jesus. And we're shaking our heads. We don't want that guy to be the one confessing 
the confession on which the church stands. We want the clean. We want the moral. We want the people who have their acts together making those statements in our Bibles. But no. I, I look at that. My life is better than that guy. I'm a pastor. I spend my life at the church. Instead, Mark wants us, as we look at this scene, to move from where we are standing and come and stand alongside the centurion as just like him. The centurion is not one of us, we think. Oh, he is the right one to be making this confession. He is confessing on behalf of us, the rest of us who are sinners in need of Jesus. So on this All Saints Day, I give you Saint Centurion. Right? Saint Centurion. The sinner is the saint. It's what Mark wants us to see. The shocking irony of a very despicable human being saying what needs to be said, and he says it for us. He says it on behalf of us. He's saying stuff of saints, of legends. It's the glory of the gospel in an unexpected place. A reminder by Mark throughout his entire biography that whether we like it or not, the gospel is going to come and hunt us down and take us by surprise and show us that we need Jesus. Sinners. Filthy sinners in need of Jesus. We need this one who said, I came to be a ransom for many, for us. We come and we stand beside that centurion and we take our place among the sinners and we declare with the centurion in all of the church, and all of the saints throughout history, truly, this was the Son of God. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you so much that you don't leave us to ourselves that you give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Help us see ourselves as the centurion in need of you. Remind us on this All Saints Day of Saint Centurion, the one who speaks the truth for us, speaks the gospel for us as you died because you love us. In your name I pray, amen.
service and for all people according to their needs, please respond with hear our prayer. O oh Lord, faithful God, we commend ourselves, our bodies and souls and all things into your keeping. Deliver us in your righteousness from all that would harm the body or assault the soul. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, send your spirit to the ministers of the church who bring the good news of Christ's death and resurrection, that they may work through the preaching of the gospel to gather the lost, kindle the faith in those who do not yet believe, and sustain us all to the day of Christ's coming, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Gentle Lord, visit the homes of your people, that they may be places where faith is nurtured, where we learn to live our new lives in holiness and righteousness, Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord God, and blessed are the persecuted who suffer for your sake, and whose witness calls all to faithfulness. Bring peace to the nations, make our leaders wise, just, and honorable, and deliver us from terror, violence, and oppression. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, comfort us by your abiding presence and satisfy all who call on you in need. We pray now especially for Cheryl Mateel and Pastor Mateel and family in the death of Cheryl's dad. We pray for Judy, Alan, Bob, Billy, Paul, Nicholas, Tommy, Tyra, Larry, Shirley, Bob, Debbie, Ruthie, John, Irvin and Marilyn, Jean, Marie, and Bookie. We also pray for those we name now in our hearts. Grant all these patients in the midst of suffering, and according to your will, release them from their afflictions. Lord, in your mercy. O oh Lord, be with your church and all her members who belong to you by baptism and faith. At the bidding of the Lamb, our shepherd, give us ears to hear your word and faith to receive him in his blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, grant that we may be brought to everlasting life with the faithful who have gone before us, who now rest from their labors. Lord, in your mercy. Your Almighty Father, we give you thanks that you have washed us in the blood of the Lamb, written our names in the book of life, and have made us royal priesthood and heirs of an eternal inheritance. Though we are unworthy of your saving grace, we pray you to hear us in the name of Jesus Christ, in whom with whom and through whom all glory and honor is yours, Heavenly Father, with the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity. All who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In your righteous judgment, you condemned the sin of Adam and Eve who ate the forbidden fruit, and you justly barred them and all their children from the tree of life. Yet in your great mercy, you promised salvation by a second Adam, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
and made his cross a life-giving tree for all who trust in him. We give you thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may faithfully eat and drink of the fruits of his cross and receive the blessing of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, he said, this is my body given for you for the remission of sins. He also took the cup. He said, this is my blood, the blood of the New Testament poured out and shed for the forgiveness of your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Jesus, strengthen and preserve you to life everlasting when you leave today. You can go knowing that your sins have been forgiven. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you've refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. going to depart with this blessing, but I always say this blessing is also a promise. This is your promise as you leave today and throughout this week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace.
Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Don wants me to make sure you know that there's a Bible study right now in the, in the back room.